Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Starling, and I'm the Director of Military and Veteran Affairs here at the Marines Memorial Club. On behalf of General Myatt, our President and CEO, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to meet James Bradley and to discuss his new book, China Mirage. So this is not a Barnes & Noble bookstore. We're at the Marines Memorial Club, and I know that all of you know who James Bradley is, so he's not going to need a very long introduction. You know that his father was one of the Iwo Jima flag raisers, and you know that his book, Flags of Our Fathers, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list and was subsequently made into a great motion picture by Steven Spielberg and Clint Eastwood. James Bradley has studied and traveled extensively throughout Asia. And now please help me welcome a distinguished author and historian, James Bradley. Thank you, folks. It's great to be here. But I hate to do this, but I have to tell the United States Marine Corps the real truth about the flag raising on Iwo Jima. You know, my dad was a Navy corpsman. He was the only Navy member of the flag raising. And the truth is, is that the uh, Marines were struggling with the pole. Five Marines were struggling with a pole up on uh, Iwo Jima. And then the sergeant, Sergeant Mike Strank, said to my father, hey, Doc, lend us a hand. So the moral there is that the uh, Marines could not get a flag up without the Navy. <laughs> Hate to tell you that. But thank you for having me. Uh, my fourth book, uh, The China Mirage, and it's about a lot of myths in American history. The China Mirage recalls U.S. relations from George Washington to Richard Nixon. And the China Mirage refers to this intellectual stumbling block in the American mind about the biggest country in Asia, China. And it's the idea that Americans for generations have hoped and prayed and believed that old China is going to go away. We don't really like how China is conducting its affairs. And a new China is going to arise. And this new China is going to be a little easier to get along with, a little more hip, a little more modern, a little more westernized, Americanized, and pray to Jesus, hopefully Christianized. And this idea, this mirage has been in the American mind for generations, but it's a mirage that has no roots in Asia. Now, this is not just some small intellectual concept. As you'll see, the China mirage has resulted in over 200,000 American combat deaths in three preventable wars, World War II in the Pacific, Korea, and Vietnam. The China mirage has distorted U.S. domestic politics. McCarthyism is rooted in this China mirage, and it has warped U.S. foreign policy. I mean, incredibly enough, for 30 years of your and my lifetime, the United States State Department said to the world, hey, look at those billion Chinese in China on the mainland. They're not real Chinese. Let's look over here to this rock in the Pacific, Taiwan. This is the, this is the true China. This is the American-loving China. And we only recognized uh, Taiwan and ignored for a generation uh, those billion Chinese on the mainland. That's a distortion of US foreign policy. So that's a little summary. But let's uh, put some meat on the bones. The Statue of Liberty symbol of liberty. We've all seen this in our history books. You know, there's many other pictures that, uh, many other things that were happening at the same time that we're not as eager to show. Here's a picture of uh, the Chinese being cleaned out of Chinatown. So at the same time that we were putting up a, a statue saying we welcomed everyone into our mosaic, we were also ethnic cleansing the Chinese out of the United States. This is the story. The Chinese from the Pearl River Delta heard about Gold Mountain, the gold rush in California. And they came here in great numbers. The Chinese were very skilled miners. And uh, they uh, mined more efficiently than the white miners. And this created a lot of animosity. And as you probably know, 
there are a lot of new laws to restrict the Chinese ability to mine. And then along came Abraham Lincoln and the desire to have a transcontinental railroad. Well, white laborers worked on the railroad. Some started in the east going west, and some started in California going east. The white laborers in California hit the Sierra Nevada mountains, that hard granite, and they threw down their picks in defeat. And we had to bring in the Chinese who had a little skill in uh, building the Great Wall of China and a few other projects for a few thousand years. And they bored through the Sierra Nevadas and the governor of California wrote to the president of the United States and he said, without the special skills of the Chinese laborers, the western part of this great transcontinental railway would not have been completed. Well, after the transcontinental railway was complete, the Chinese dispersed all over the west. And there were Chinatowns in almost every railroad town in the United States. A, um, a, a, a true rendering, or I should say, John Wayne movies would be accurate if John Wayne stayed in a Chinese hotel and he bought his bullets in a Chinese hardware store and he ate in a Chinese restaurant. The Chinese were all over the western part of the United States. But this was a problem um, for the Americans. Here's a picture of the final stake on the Transcontinental Railway being driven. You'll notice that it only has whites in the picture. This is very interesting because the, the rail in the picture was laid down by Chinese laborers early that morning. And then the, when it came time to take the picture, we pushed the Chinese out of the picture frame, just as we've tried to push their contributions out of American history. So when the Chinese dispersed around the West, a terrible thing was about to happen. They would breed with the white women and then democracy might fall. So the United States Congress, in its wisdom, in 1982, uh, determined that you couldn't get democracy into those Chinese noggins, that Chinese brains couldn't absorb democracy. That's really what the US Senate did say. You'll see their official language in the book. And they said, therefore, for the health of the republic, it's necessary to exclude the Chinese from the United States. Up until 1882, there was no concept of Ill illegal immigration. We welcomed everyone into our mosaic until, for the first time, we excluded somebody, and it was the Chinese on the basis of race. Here's a picture of the chief of police of Seattle leading uh, vigilantes. They surrounded Chinatown, gave the Chinese one hour to get out of town, and uh, put them on a ship. In Tacoma, they put them on trains, ran the trains out to the countryside, stopped the trains, and then shot them. The point here is that we distorted our immigration. If we had not excluded the Chinese from our mosaic in the 19th century, it wouldn't be unusual for Washington Governor Gary Locke to be ambassador to China. We would have had many such uh, uh, back and forth relationships like that across the Pacific. We would have a wide bridge of understanding between the United States and China rather than the narrow rickety bridge that we have right now. So we didn't want any Chinese living next door to us here in the United States, but when we looked at those Chinese over in China, we imagined what they wanted to be. My point is, we scraped the Chinese off the uh, western part of the United States, and it's as if we ended up with a big blank screen, and then we projected imagery of what we wanted the Chinese to be. This picture is taken from a Harper's magazine in the 1800s, and this was the image of the Chinese that we liked. Uh, Chinese who looked up to the United States, Chinese that wanted to grow up and be just like us, Americanized and Christianized. This is really what I mean by the China mirage, this American idea that, uh, that, the, that the Chinese are really looking to be little Democrats uh, like us. 
So let's jump to the life of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's amazing to me that when we hear the name Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we should immediately think China. It was one of the major influences in, in young FDR's life. His mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, grew up in a mansion in Hong Kong. Sarah Delano Roosevelt was the one who paid Franklin's bills. Franklin Roosevelt never had uh, any big high paying jobs. He was a public servant most of his life. But he had yachts, he had townhouses in New York, summer place up in Maine. Where did that money come from? It came from the Delano line. Where did the Delanos get the money? Grandpa Warren Delano was the American opium king of China. He was the biggest American opium dealer. So it's as if the Cali cartel shoving cocaine into the United States grew a president of, of Colombia. Now, people are surprised Warren Delano was an opium dealer, a, a criminal in the eyes of, of, the, of the Chinese. And some people think this is just a little slice of, an unusual slice of history that I've picked out, but it isn't. If you, if you go all over the East Coast, you'll see the influence of opium fortunes. Look at, go to the campus at Yale University. The, uh, the, the tomb, which is the headquarters for the Skull and Bones Society, is on the campus of Yale University. That tomb is still financially supported by the Russell Trust. Warren Delano worked for the Russell family. It was the Russell company that he worked for, the biggest opium dealers in China. This is, Yale is built on land uh, donated by uh, opium barons. The number one most famous building on Columbia's campus is the Lowe Library. That's named after Abbott Lowe, who dealt opium with Warren Delano out there in China. Princeton University's first big, big benefactor was Stephen Green. Stephen Green took over Russell and Company's opium operations after Warren Delano returned back to the United States a rich man. America's first manufacturing city, Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts, was founded by opium money. The first railroads in the East Coast, opium money. Uh, Ralph Waldo M. Emerson, the great transcendentalist, how come he had so much time to sit around and think? Because he married into an opium fortune. The Council on Foreign Relations, the Coolidge family, opium. Chiquita Banana, AT&T. Scratch the history of anybody with the name Forbes in their name, like Secretary of State John Forbes Carey, and you'll see an opium fortune. His great-grandfather was an opium dealer. So, you know, when the Chinese talk about 100 years of humi humiliation, this is what they're talking about. We were shoving opium uh, under the uh, guys, uh, under the eyes of the British, French, and the United States navies, Warren Delano was counsel out there in Canton and welcomed the first Navy ships, U.S. Navy ships, to participate in the first Opium War. Uh, go over to Canton, which is Guangzhou now, and you'll see statues uh, uh, celebrating the man who asked Warren Delano to please stop a smuggling opium. Go to New York's Chinatown. You'll see the Chinese Americans have, elected, have erected two statues to their heroes. One is to Confucius. The other one is to, the, is to Commissioner Lin, the official that asked Warren Delano to give up uh, his opium stocks. So now let's jump to the 20th century. Sun Yat-sen was the George Washington of China, and his number one money man was Charlie Song. I love the story of Charlie Song in this book. Charlie Song, at a young age, emigrated to the East Coast of America. And uh, that was a smart move, because on the West Coast, we were shooting the Chinese into the sea. Charlie, as an as a 18-year-old, goes to North Carolina. And Southern Methodists in North Carolina convert him. And the newspapers hail this. Charlie Song is the only North Carolinian Chinese Christian, the newspapers say. 
And the Southern Methodists in, in, in North Carolina uh, think Charlie is going to go back as a missionary and help with this uh, new China that's going to be grown. China is going to be Americanized, Christianized. Charlie Song is going to help out. Well, Charlie goes back to China, and he quickly realizes what the American missionaries won't admit, and that is very few Chinese want to be Christianized and Americanized. So Charlie's a smart guy. He, he sees the missionary pipeline of money going to China. Millions of dollars from American pews going to China. Nothing happening in China. The Chinese aren't converting. But American missionaries are writing letters back. The China Mirage saying, for just a few more dollars, the Chinese will eventually become Christianized. Charlie Song sees that pipeline, and he decides to tap into it. Charlie makes a deal with the American Bible Society to print Bibles in Shanghai. The missionaries are buying Bibles from Charlie to pursue the dream, and Charlie gets rich on the China Mirage. Charlie Song has a remarkable family, brilliant kids. The famous Song sisters, Ai Ling, Ching Ling, and Mei Ling Song, and a brilliant son, TV Song. And Charlie educates his children in the United States at Harvard, Wellesley, and Wesleyan University. These four kids spend a combined 40 years, four decades, in the United States being educated, and they're the only Chinese in their universities. And in talking to their American classmates, they quickly understand Americans don't know much about China, but they believe this mirage that China is about to be Christianized. And just like their father, they figure out a way to tap into that missionary pipeline for great riches. At this time in the early 1930s, uh, China's future was being tussled over by Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. What I didn't realize till I wrote this book is that even before Franklin Delano Roosevelt came into office in 1933, Mao was a winner and Chiang Kai-shek was a loser. You'll see in the book that Mao and Chiang fought titanic battles in the early 1930s. Millions of dead, millions of casualties, and Mao Zedong beat Chiang Kai-shek every single time. Mao was a winner, but Mao didn't get any publicity in the United States. We didn't know this because the Song family had taken over the job of propagandizing for Chiang Kai-shek. Ai Ling Song, the leader of the Song family, called in Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek and said, look it, uh, China's richest family, we Songs, will ally with you against Mao Zedong under four conditions. Number one, you put my husband as, in as your prime minister. Number two, you put my brother in as your treasury secretary. Number three, you marry my younger sister. And number four, we're going to convert you and make you a Christian. So Ai Ling Song puts her family in Chiang Kai-shek's bedroom pockets and office and makes them a Christian. All of a sudden, you, you have this imagery of Chiang Kai-shek, who's basically a a little Hitler warlord uh, reading the Bible. And Americans are seeing this, and oh my God, the China Mirage is about to come about. All we have to do is support Chiang Kai-shek, and this China Mirage will, uh, will happen. So you begin to see images like this. Chiang Kai-shek and Mei Ling Song married, front page of New York Times, oh my God, Older pictures of Chinese being married were studies in strangeness. Pagans with long fingernails and ponytails and man dresses. Now all of a sudden, here's a Brooks Brothers wedding. They, they uh, played Christian hymns at the wedding. The China Mirage is about to happen. China's about to be Christianized. Well, the truth in China was that Mao Zedong was rising and Chiang Kai-shek was falling. Chiang Kai-shek was kidnapping his soldiers. He would strip them nude, tie them up, and, they'd ha and walk them away from their provinces so they wouldn't run away. He, I mean, he'd strip them nude at night so they, they wouldn't escape. He had horrible desertions and fatalities in his army. On, uh, on the other side, uh, people were walking over the mountains to join Mao Zedong's movement. But America didn't get that message. 
uh, the, the message from China came from the Song family. T.V. Song was a Harvard graduate. He bonded with Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the Oval Office. They, the State Department uh, uh, did not want the Song family in direct contact with President Roosevelt. They wrote memos about it, that this is not a good idea to go around the State Department. But FDR and TV Song uh, bonded. FDR would later give Chiang Kai-shek and the Song family more money than we spent on the atom bomb. They were very successful in their lobbying. And again, FDR saw imagery and heard stories of how Chiang Kai-shek wanted to put a new deal into China. Chiang Kai-shek wanted to have a Christianized China, and Mao Zedong was just a bandit off to the side that uh, nobody had to worry about. The opposite of reality in China. The China mirage in Washington at odds with China reality in China. Henry Luce was the founder of Time magazine. This was the first huge multimedia juggernaut. And Henry Luce was born in China, the son of missionaries. And Henry Luce did everything he possibly could to promote Chiang Kai-shek, who he uh, promoted as America's great Christian leader. He used the great resources of his multimedia empire to promote the Christian dictator, Chiang Kai-shek. Incredibly, Henry Luce put Chang on more Time magazine covers than he put Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Winston Churchill. By the way, the name of my book is The China Mirage. Winston Churchill called it the great, no, the grand American illusion. He said to one of his generals, he said, when I went to America, if I learned anything, it was the word China. China stands out in the American mind. They mention Chinese armies in the same words as the Russian, in the same sentences with the Russian armies. Over and over, uh, uh, Churchill warned his generals to beware of the grand American illusion in the American mind, the China mirage. The number one author of the 1930s was a daughter of missionaries in China. Her name was Pearl Buck. She wrote The, the, uh, the Good Earth. The Good Earth was the only book of the 20th century that was number one for two years in a row. This is beyond a blockbuster. This was one of the biggest selling books ever. Now, this is very interesting. It's the 1930s. There's very few Chinese in the United States. They're huddled in their Chinatowns. It's illegal for a Chinese to come here. We don't want any Chinese living next door to us. But Pearl Buck writes a book about these lovable Chinese, and Americans fall in love with them. This is what I'm saying. We love those Chinese over in China that will, wanted to be like us. We loved the myth. We loved the mirage. Pearl Buck becomes a supposed expert on China. She gives speeches. One speech at the University of Virginia, she explained that Chinese and Americans are almost exactly alike. They differ in skin, but we both are from huge countries, deserts, plains. We eat many of the same grains. And you'll find that the Chinese hearts beat just like the American hearts. They want to be just like us. Pearl Buck. When the movie The Good Earth was made, uh, they couldn't have Chinese characters because there were laws against uh, whites uh, uh, touching or kissing a Chinese person on screen. So the Chinese characters were Americans in uh, Chinese makeup. Well, what was Chiang Kai-shek's problem in the 1930s? It was that the Chinese had invaded uh, his country. And after the rape of, oh, uh, I, I want to say something I learned in this book. You know, the, Chi the Japanese went into China, and we can see a lot of new newsreels about the brutalities of the Japanese in China. One thing I didn't realize is that who supplied the Japanese all that military equipment, all that oil and gasoline and steel throughout the 1930s? It was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The State Department said, frankly, there's no, there's no resources in China that we can't get anywhere else. It really doesn't matter if Japan takes all of China. But on the other hand, Japan was America's best industrial customer in Asia. Japan was buying one half of our cotton crop. 
supplying silk for hosiery, and American industry made tremendous profits supplying the Japanese war machine all throughout the 1930s. Well, Chiang Kai-shek saw an opportunity here. After the rape of Nanking in 1937, Chang and the Song family meet with their, fa with their favorite uh, syncophants, uh, American missionaries, and they devise a plan. These missionaries go to New York and they establish a China lobby committee in downtown Manhattan, two blocks from the New York Public Library. It's staffed by American missionaries and it's headed by the first Washington wise man, Henry Stimson, the former Secretary of State, the genius of foreign relations in the United States in the 1930s. And they call their committee the American Committee for the Non-Participation in Japanese Aggression. And that's what they wanted to do. Chiang Kai-shek and the Songs uh, founded this committee to propagandize Americans to stop supplying the Japanese. And this argument was very sophisticated, very uh, slick uh, uh, brochures, uh, speeches, radio uh, advertising. Two years of propagandizing the American public convinced 75% of the Americans, according to the Gallup poll, that you could cut Japan's oil with no problem. This was the argument. Americans, you should feel guilty about what you're doing. You're supplying the Japanese war machine that is not only killing the Chinese, but it's keeping China from being an Americanized, uh, Christianized country. And if America doesn't have to go to war, America doesn't have to fight anybody, we can make just like a Gandhi move, just cut Japan's oil, and this is what'll happen. The Japanese military will be humiliated and they will retreat from China. A new China will rise, that Christianized uh, a new China. And Henry Stimson said, is there a chance that the Japanese would retaliate against us? Oh, no, no way. The Japanese would never do anything like that. We only look for peace. This is a peace plan, America. So they produce brochures with names like this. Shall America stop arming Japan? This is my favorite pamphlet. America's share in Japan's war guilt. Wow, look at the cover. Japanese planes dropping Japanese bombs on the Chinese, but the bombs are made from American steel, and there's gasoline in the Japanese airplanes. Hey, I'm an American. America's share in Japan's war guilt? I have a share in the guilt of, wow. B Japanese bombs made from U.S. steel. What's going on here? <gasps> Look, Uncle Sam is the armorer of Japan. Oil for the death of China. Boycott the aggressor. Disgraceful to do nothing. Well, R Franklin Roosevelt disagreed. Roosevelt said to cut off oil to Japan would precipitate war in the Pacific. The United States will not shut off oil to Japan and thereby force her into a military expedition against Indonesia. There was no Indonesia at that time. It was called the Dutch East Indies, but I just changed the name to bring it up to date. So FDR said, hey, you cut off oil, the United States is going to have a war in the, in the Pacific. We're going to get involved. I don't want a war in the Pacific. I have a Europe first policy. I want to help Winston Churchill confront um, Hitler in Europe. And to do that, I have to keep peace in the Pacific because I'm withdrawing my military resources out of the Pacific. And there will never be a war in the Pacific if I continue to supply Japan with oil. Japan was buying 80% of their oil from the United States at that point. And Roosevelt knew there would be no war if he kept that tap open because the Japanese were dependent on it. The State Department agreed with him. They said, if you cut off Japan's oil, Japan will go down to Indonesia and America will be involved in a war. Well, as I said, 75% of um, the American public is bamboozled into this idea that you can easily cut Japan's oil with no blowback. And now again, 
the, the, what they were focused on, the argument with Japan wasn't over silk or cotton or anything. It was about China. For generations, we had been dreaming about the rise of new China, Christianized, and it will happen if we just get the Japanese off the Chinese back by cutting the oil. So in July of 1941, Roosevelt is about to disappear from the United States, but he doesn't tell the public why. He's going to go up to Canada to meet Winston Churchill in what later will be called the Atlantic Conference. Churchill's at war. There's wartime secrecy. We're not at war. But Roosevelt is about to go to Canada. He's about to leave. And you'll see in the book that there were rock and roll cabinet meetings where his cabinet members were arguing with him that it's immoral to keep selling Japan oil. And Roosevelt, the brilliant politician, knew that 75% of the public was against him on this. So he makes a final appeal to the United to Americans. He stands up at Hyde Park, and Roosevelt makes a speech. And FDR says to uh, Americans, you might ask, why are we selling Japan oil, helping Japan in what looks like an act of aggression? Well, Japan doesn't have oil of their own. If we had cut their oil off, they probably would have gone down to Indonesia a year ago, and you would have had war. Therefore, there is a method in letting oil go to Japan with the hope, and it's worked for two years, of keeping war out of the South Pacific. Here you have Franklin Roosevelt saying, I have kept the peace in the Pacific for two years. We can continue to have a, a peace, no war in the Pacific, but you got to keep the oil spigot open. He thinks he's made his case, and then he gets on the presidential yacht. People on shore off the coast of Connecticut see the president waving to them goodbye. He's going off on a 10-day fishing trip, but that's not the president. It's a double. The Secret Service had put Roosevelt on a destroyer and ran him up uh, to Canada. Now, it's August of 1941. The big cat is away, and the China lobby influenced mice within Roosevelt's administration decide to play. The first wise man, Secretary of War Stimson, says Japan would never attack the United States. The number two wise man, Assistant Secretary of State Dean Acheson, says no rational Japanese would ever attack the United States. And these guys with some other Confederates you'll see in the book cut Japan's oil. Now they do it three, four levels down from FDR. FDR at his, you know, he's up in Canada, the Secretary of State is in uh, West Virginia, much of Washington is gone, it's August 1941, no air conditioning, Roosevelt's out of the country, nobody knows where he is, you know, a lot of things came together here. And Roosevelt can see that the State Department is continuing to approve oil to Japan. But three, four levels down below those approvals, these uh, Washington wise men, geniuses, do the moral thing, they think, and they cut Japan's oil. You know what, folks? I got a degree in East Asian studies many years ago. I didn't know till I researched this book that the President of the United States did not know for 30 days that Japan's oil had been cut. One month went by. Now, this isn't a small thing. The number one thing Roosevelt said would make a war in the Pacific is cutting Japan's oil. That number one thing had been done, and the President of the United States did not know for one month. Well, so we cut Japan's oil, and guess what? In Japan, their leader's hair was on fire. The advisors to Hirohito said, Japan is going to be an industrialized beach whale. We don't want to fight the United States, but we don't have a chance here. I mean, we don't have a choice here. We have to go strike out. No oil, no Japan. We've got to go south to Indonesia. And the plan was to hit Pearl Harbor as a sideshow. You know, some Americans think of Pearl Harbor as the invasion of the United States. It wasn't. Japan could have taken Hawaii in about two minutes. 
They didn't want to invade the United States. They just wanted to hit the Navy to stop it from interfering with their thrust for the precious oil that they had to go get now because the wise men cut the supply. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is up in Canada singing Onward Christian Soldiers with, uh, with uh, Winston Churchill. They're, plan they're making detailed plans for war across the Atlantic. They're not discussing the Pacific because Roosevelt said to Churchill, don't worry, there will be no war with Japan. I'm feeding them oil. They will never attack us. Roosevelt didn't know that he had been stabbed in the back by these China lobby believing administration officials who continued to propagandize that uh, American and Chinese interests were aligned and, and uh, you can help China by cutting that Japanese oil. So guess what the Japanese did? They did exactly what Franklin Delano Roosevelt had anticipated. They went south for oil in Indonesia, which involved us in a Pacific war, a preventable war. Yes, my dad raised the flag in Iwo Jima. Yes, I learn now my father was involved in a war that Franklin Roosevelt had prevented for two years and was sure would never happen if he was allowed to keep that oil open. So I agree with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. World War II in the Pacific was an entirely preventable war. So now we get into World War II. And, oh, you know, I wanted to talk about this. You know, American school children are being uh, told that the United States went into World War II to help Winston Churchill defend democracy against Hitler. And I don't know when that happened. December 8th, we declare war on Japan. December 9th, Churchill's begging us to get involved in Europe. No, 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 we're not, no. December 10th, no, no, we're not declaring war on him. It wasn't until Hitler rashly declared war on us that we got involved in Europe. World War II came to the United States from Asia, and it came to the United States from Asia because we were looking at that China mirage. So in World War II, Mao Zedong is, again, the mandate of heaven is moving to Mao. But the propagandists in the United States are only showing Chiang Kai-shek on the cover of Time magazine. We know little about Mao. John Service of the State Department goes to meet Mao and, ha and is the American official who talks with Mao the most in 1944-1945. John Service was fluent in four Chinese dialects. He had been born in China. Um, he, he was a brilliant guy. And he saw that the mandate was moving to Mao, that Mao would be the next emperor. And Mao is saying to John Service, and you'll see it in the book, he says, hey, Mao says to the United States State Department, I'm going to be the next emperor. Chiang Kai-shek's going to fall away. You're supporting the wrong horse, and he's raking you over the coals, number one. Number two, I want to be an ally of the United States. Why, why do I want to partner with the Soviet Union? Uh, Germany is killing uh, Russia. Russia doesn't have the money like the United States does. I'm Mao, a practical guy. I want to ally with the United States. And you'll see in the book that Mao paints the relationship that exists right today between China and the United States. Mao says, I've got this huge labor force that's uh, hardworking and can be well-educated. You have the capital and the technology. We have a symbiotic relationship here. We got to put this together. Mao says there can be no disagreements or misunderstandings between the United States and China. Our interests run together. Mao is reaching out to the United States. Mao writes a cable to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mao had never been on an airplane, but he's willing to get on an airplane to come to the White House to say, I'm going to be the next emperor, and you're getting blackmailed by Chiang Kai-shek. It doesn't make sense. Mao was looking to reach out to the United States. And these, uh, these uh, efforts at friendship were blocked by a lot of people in the China lobby. So Mao, arises, Mao becomes the emperor in 1949. And you know, my school books told me that Mao was an immediately an aggressive American hater. Well, you know what? 
Five years earlier, he'd reached out to the United States. The United States not only spurned his hand, but supported Chiang Kai-shek. Mao had said to the State Department, don't support Chiang Kai-shek. We'll have a civil war. Millions will die. I'm going to win in the end. If America doesn't support Chiang, I'll take over earlier. You support Chiang, millions will die. I'm going to win. Mao was right. The Washington wise men, out of spite, then uh, uh, did not recognize Mao's government. Chiang flees to Taiwan, and the United States State Department says, that's not China on the mainland. This rock here in the Pacific, this is China. I think Chiang went to church this morning. It's true. It sounds funny, but for 30 years, Taiwan was China, and China was not. Because of this China mirage, this is what America had been uh, imagining for generations, this China that wanted to become like us. So Mao rises, and you have to put yourself in the, in the place of my grandparents and my parents who are in America, and all they, they have only seen imagery of Chiang Kai-shek as the leader of China, and China is going to be Christianized. Now all of a sudden, a pagan who used to live in a cave, Mao Zedong, is the emperor of China. Something must be wrong here. I know China wants to be democratic. There must have been traitors in the State Department. Joe McCarthy rides this wave. McCarthyism was embedded in this surprise Americans had because they were looking at this mirage. Look at the first speech that Joe McCarthy made that made him a national figure. McCarthy holds a sheaf of papers and he says, I have the names of 223 communists in the State Department. Well, if you read the speech, he only mentions one commie in the State Department, and that's John Service. The guy who knew Mao Zedong best was the first guy that McCarthy had to get out of the State Department. McCarthyism then sweeps out every Chinese speaker in the State Department. Everybody who knew Zhou Enlai or Mao Zedong was fired from the State Department. Incredibly enough, during the 1950s, we had zero people in the United States State Department that could speak Chinese. You speak Chinese, we don't want you. See this island over here in Taiwan? You know, the songs speak English. We can speak directly to them. So the propaganda continues. Chiang Kai-shek, the far-sighted uh, leader, the friend of America, and look at Mao on the cover of Time magazine. Man, what a bad guy running this slave economy, all these slave ants under Mao. Wow, they're Chinese people with these commies on top of them. No smiles in China anymore, according to the American press once that China Mirage bubble had been popped. Let's go to 1950. Wise man Secretary of State Dean Acheson is in charge, and they draw a, pair, uh, a border in the ancient kingdom of Korea, and they make a North Korea and a South Korea. Well, South Korea invaded the North, the North invaded the South, it was back and forth, tit for tat. Then the North comes in heavy duty. They push the, the Koreans and the Americans down the peninsula. The Americans and the South Koreans push the North Koreans back to the 38th parallel. And at that point, we could have declared victory, and a tiny little Asian war, civil war, would have been finished. But Dean Acheson says, let's roll back communism. We made a mistake with Mao. We should have hit him harder. Let's roll back communism. Let's roll across the 38th parallel up to the Yalu River, up to the border of China. Well, guess what? The Japanese invaded China through that same border. China had just suffered 20 years of Nazi-like domination because the Japanese came over that border. Mao Zedong had a tired civil war uh, 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 experienced country, he didn't want to fight the United States military. Mao goes, calls in the Indian ambassador and says, send a message to Harry Truman. This is Mao's second outreach to a president. Send a message to Harry Truman that he can't have MacArthur go over the 38th parallel. If he does, I'm going to have to get involved. 
I can't let the US military go up to the Chinese border. General MacArthur was on the front page of the New York Times threatening atomic warfare against China. Mao said, I don't want to fight. Let's just you know, stay where you are. No, fo no fighting between China and the United States. I don't want to fight you. Uh, Dean Acheson says, ho, 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 even though he'd never been to Asia, says, Mao's bluffing. He greenlights MacArthur. MacArthur goes over the 38th parallel. Uh, Mao enters the war. A tiny little Asian civil war becomes a big, big, bloody war because we don't understand China. That's the second war of the 20th century because we misunderstand China. Oh, Ho Chi Minh. Man, no, no friend of Time magazine. Well, Ho Chi Minh is doing what Mao Zedong did. He wrote seven letters to Harry Truman saying basically what Mao had said. I want American capital and technology. Oh, I've got Vietnamese workers. The relationship that exists right now between Vietnam and the United States, that's what Ho Chi Minh was pitching to Harry Truman. Seven letters. They exist. You can read them. Dean Acheson never answered any of the letters. Instead, Acheson gave the first $10 million to the French military to fight Ho Chi Minh. You know, we're all proud of the Marshall Plan. We get taught the Marshall Plan in school. One little detail is left out. Harry Truman gave the French more money to fight Ho Chi Minh than he gave the French for democracy in Europe. We get into the Vietnam War. We slip and slide into the Vietnam War. Dwight Eisenhower creates a Potemkin country called South Vietnam. When I grew up, I thought there was a country called South Vietnam. South Vietnam was a CIA front. It was never a country that had uh, like a tax base and citizens that paid taxes in. And it, it, it wasn't like that. It was an American-supported uh, front that used the military to control its territory. It wasn't a legitimate government. I'm over in Vietnam researching now, and I have Vietnamese saying, boy, you Americans have got a lot of imagination. You drew a line across my country. All of a sudden, I can't go visit my uncle because he lives in something called North Vietnam, and I live in something called South Vietnam. He says, you convinced the New York Times of this. You failed to convince us. We have one country. We're Vietnamese. McGeorge Bundy, national security advisor to uh, Lyndon Johnson and John F. Kennedy. On McGeorge Bundy's White House desk was a picture of Henry Stimson, the first wise man that got us into World War II in the Pacific. McGeorge Bundy believed in the domino theory. What was the domino theory? It wasn't a theory about Vietnam. It was a theory about China. The theory was, once China gobbles up Vietnam, it's going to gobble. Uh, LBJ said, what's going to happen if China gobbles up Viet, uh, that little itty-bitty uh, Vietnam? What's going to happen to all those other little itty-bitty countries? This is a theory, again, in Washington about how China thinks. It's a theory that is not based in reality in China. China didn't have these designs. But George, McGeorge Bundy was such a brilliant white, wise man that he designed the bombing campaign of Vietnam without ever visiting the country. Now listen to the words of Lyndon Johnson. In the late 1940s, early 1950s, Lyndon Johnson saw the Who Lost China knife fights that McCarthy started and saw that Harry Truman didn't run for re-election in 1952 uh, mostly based on this who lost China hysteria. So Johnson sees a Democratic president fall because Congress is asking who lost China, right? So Johnson, two days after the Kennedy assassination, has his first meeting on Vietnam. And Johnson walks into the room and blurts out, I'm not going to be the president to lose in Vietnam. I'm not going to be the president to see Vietnam go the way that China went. So how are we looking at China now? Look at these magazine covers. Angry China, the dangers of a rising China. 
You know, the United States military is much larger than the Chinese military, but we, we can't see imagery like that of, of our boys in uh, uniform. America's fear of China. China's crackdown. You know, the Chinese leadership uh, is putting about 50, 60 million people into the middle class every year. It's the uh, biggest wealth generator in the history of the world. Uh, the Wall Street Journal the other day said that much of the world wealth, something like 60% of the world wealth generated in the world shared by Americans and many other country is a result of China's productivity. Some pretty smart managers over in there, there in China, but this is how we're looking at them. Folks, I don't think we can look to our media and to our government uh, regarding an accurate view of China. That's the message of my book, and I prove it in the 350 pages, that the media has continually distorted what China is, and our government has refused to look at the reality of China. I'm making no pitch for those poor Chinese in China. I didn't write this book so that uh, we could help the Chinese over there in Asia. I wrote the book so that the United States could sh stop shooting its collective feet off in Asia. I'm talking about 200,000 dead Americans because we refuse to just look at the reality of China. Three preventable wars, McCarthyism. You know, my dad taught me how to drive. And I think that if we were out on humanity's highway in the American car, we'd see that the biggest vehicle on humanity's road is China. It's one-fourth of humanity. And we're having discussions in the front seat about we don't like the driver of Chinese, China's car, or maybe we don't like the color of that Chinese truck. And it's as if our leaders are looking at their cell phones of imagery of how we want China to be rather than how China is. That's all I'm asking for, is a realistic view of China. China is not this third world country rising and we're going to sit around and wonder how it turns out. China, for almost all of human history, has been the biggest, strongest, richest entity in the world. It's only since the Industrial Revolution that China has tripped. It's just getting back to its uh, uh, traditional leadership. So again, this is a call not to understand the Chinese for their benefit, but just to look at reality in Asia so we stop shooting ourselves uh, in, in the feet in Asia. Now, the last thing I'd like to say is, isn't that a beautiful book cover? I'm not responsible for it. Little Brown publishers uh, came up with this through their art department, and it really symbolizes the movement within China uh, and America. And folks, I didn't know the photographer of this uh, photo. Uh, he took it in 1945, and he's with us today. He's in the front row. His name is David Robertson, and David, Stand up. Thanks for a nice book cover. Thank you, David, and, 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 and thank you, folks, for coming. And now um, I get subjected to Q&A. <laughs> you know, thank you for a really uh, great and, and interesting uh, different perspective on history than I've ever seen. And I remember uh, as a kid being six or seven years old and my, my best friend's dad would always talk about red China. And I didn't even know what the heck it meant until later in life when you start to, to learn what that means. And, and this really put a lot of things in perspective. Um, one of the photos that you showed with Roosevelt and Churchill uh, meeting in the Atlantic Conference, behind them were Admiral Ernest King and uh, George Marshall. And these were two very educated men who understood the Pacific as well as Europe. Uh, there was, you do mention in the book, there are several pages that, that are dedicated to, um, or that address Marshall in particular, uh, and also Vinegar Joe Stilwell. You had China experts within the military. What was the impact? Uh, was the military element just silenced or, or, or did they have any impact with the leadership? You know, I thank you for that question because 
the great General Marshall had served in China, and he knew, he knew that Chiang Kai-shek had these locust armies, and that the Song family and, and Chiang were just fleecing the United States with this China mirage. But General Marshall was also not only a great soldier, he was also uh, sensitive to political realities, and he knew that his commander-in-chief had this China mirage in his head. So General Marshall, you'll see in the book, all of his advisors in China are writing saying, Chang's not going to fight the Japanese. Chang's just sitting around waiting for the war to end so that he can confront Mao. And, and Stilwell is saying, Chang is hopelessly corrupt. He's not the future. We have to work with Mao. Mao is a much more effective fighting force. So the US military is accurately seeing reality in China. And uh, that famous memo from Roosevelt to Marshall, Roosevelt just says, you're wrong. You can't treat Chiang Kai-shek that way. In just 30 years, he's risen up and built a democracy in China that's taken us 200 years. When Mei Ling Song came to the White House, Roosevelt said in a press conference to all of America that China is one of the great democracies of the world. And we don't know if this was hopeful thinking, but that definitely the China mirage was in President Roosevelt's head. The United States military thought very differently. One of the most interesting figures in history from that time, uh, and you, you touched on it briefly in your presentation, was Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, there were several questions about uh, her role in this and her influence both uh, at home with the people of China and in the U.S. in particular. Can you expand on that? Well, older sister Ai Ling Song told Mei Ling, you're going to marry Chiang Kai-shek. The middle sister thought this was horrible and kind of broke off from the family and supported Mao. But Madam Chiang Kai-shek was in this kind of dynastic royal marriage with Chiang Kai-shek. The families were bound up together. And she was a, an extremely effective propagandist. She broadcast to the United States, wrote articles in American magazines, was often quoted. And it was as if a nice, fresh Wellesley college girl had taken over China and was guiding it along. And she was central to this China mirage. Henry Luce, uh, uh, in the book, you can see that he ch chooses her as the most likable symbol for Americans. And he invites her to America to go on a tour. And she gets up in front of Congress, and she says the China Mirage. She says, if the Chinese people could speak to you in your own tongue, they would say that we want to, the number one thing we want to do in China is embrace American ideals. We're in this together, and we want to be uh, just, just like you. So she knew what bells to ring. She rang them really well. Harry Truman is quoted in the book as saying, all the songs in Chiang Kai-shek were all thieves. And I'd like to see all of them in jail. And I hope to live to see the time they are. The export of American steel to China and also uh, providing oil or not to China, but to Japan, steel being exported to Japan and oil being exported to Japan and, and that heavy trade supporting the war machine, uh, the Japanese war machine in China at the time. Um, from your discussion, I, I got the opinion that you thought that Roosevelt should have stayed on that course. We keep feeding the bear that the damage from Japan against China would have been less globally than cutting it off and, and causing the Second World War in the Pacific. Is that kind of looking at uh, China as kind of an expendable region at the same time? Yes, but it's not my opinion. It was the opinion of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Secretary of State Hall. They did a hard dollars and cents evaluation that China had no resources that we couldn't get elsewhere. Uh, other countries, you know, were much more valuable. And Japan was this huge industrial customer for over 100 years. So as I said, uh, FDR's strategy was, I can't fight two wars in two theaters. I only have enough Navy for one theater. I'm going to work with Churchill against Hitler first. You know, I don't think Roosevelt 
particularly liked Chinese, uh, the Japanese killing Chinese, but he just had to prioritize, and he had a Europe first policy, and Roosevelt, you'll see in the book, is telling his military, don't worry about Japan, I'll continue to sell them oil. No matter what the public says, and no matter what you hear me say, Japan is going to be appeased with oil, don't worry. The Navy was very worried about war with Japan. Roosevelt, the former assistant secretary of the Navy, assured him there will be peace in the Pacific. I got it under control. Your book, you, you talked about looking at administrations from George Washington to Richard Nixon from throughout all these administrations and our China mirage. Were any of the administrations uh, between that time, did any of the administrations get it right ever? Or, or was it completely uh, Democrat, Republican, uh, didn't matter, there, there was this impressions and uh, you know, almost a, a, a fraudulent portrayal of China and US-China relations? I would say the latter. The you know, we, again, the, the Pacific is the widest uh, physical feature, and uh, not the widest, it's the biggest physical feature on the globe, and it has kept us apart. You know, a few missionaries got over, a few Chinese came our way, but there was very little contact between the United States and China, and still today, in, in, if you look at the size of the two countries, there's... Uh, uh, not that much contact, but the question goes back, did any administration get it right? Mostly we just could ignore China, and the information and the dealings with China came through our merchants and our missionaries, guys like Warren Delano, and the missionaries like, like Luce's father. And the missionaries, you know, these were highly educated people who had uh, high contacts in Washington. And there was that missionary mirage with millions of dollars flowing across the Pacific. That was the main relationship for all those years, rather than a, a Washington taking the lead. It was, it was more the missionaries. So we have time for, for one more question so you can sign books. And I got some questions about uh, looking at American foreign policy now toward uh, not just China, but toward the Pacific and all the talk of a rebalance to the Pacific and obviously this is a region that our political leaders feel is going to be critical to us both politically and economically in the out years. Uh, do you feel optimistic uh, about that kind of relationship? And from your studies and research, what, are, what is your personal opinion on Taiwan? Is that something that we will ever be able to let go uh, as it's China's really number one foreign policy issue? Uh, Taiwan's part of China, and it'll become part of China. It's just a few of us old folks have to die off, and in another couple generations, uh, it'll, it'll be like Hong Kong. It'll, it'll uh, revert back to China. In terms of the future of China-American relations, there's nobody at the top level of the Obama administration who can reach out to China based on experience, school ties, having lived in China, or, or speaking Chinese. Nobody. Now again, I'm not saying this to help those poor Chinese. I'm just saying one-fourth of humanity is Chinese. If the Chinese decide they like the color orange, it's going to change our ability to buy things colored orange, right? If all the Chinese burp at the same time, it's going to affect the environment. I mean, the the Look at the uh, TED talk that uh, Kevin Rudd, the, f the former uh, premier of uh, Australia, has on YouTube. He talks about the absolute necessity of knowing what's going on uh, in China for the future of all of, all of us. Now, I, I, I am not going to trust my government or my media to get it right on China. You'd be shocked the number of commentators who've been writing uh, about China in our newspapers and our magazines who've never been to China. Or if they have been, they did a you know, two-week whirlwind tour and we're looking to them for expertise on China. You know, we're, this should be like Sputnik. 
You know, when, when Sputnik went up, we said, man, science, dump the money in, let's go. We've got to get going. Uh, getting to know China should be that urgent. Stephen Schwartzman is one of the wealthiest men in the United States. He's chairman of the Blackstone Group in New York. Stephen Schwartzman has a huge wallet. He reached in there and took out about $300 million. And he said, for my legacy, what's the number one thing I can do for the United States of America? And he started the Schwartzman Scholars. The Schwartzman Scholars is based on the Rhodes Scholars program, but it's towards China. Stephen Schwartzman, a very smart guy, uh, does not trust the government or the media to get it right. He wants to grow a crop of American kids who will have those ties of language so that we can build a bigger bridge. That's all I'm asking for. We don't have to like what China's doing, but we just have to build a bigger bridge, have some communications so we can understand where the world's biggest truck is headed on that road of humanity. James Bradley, thank you so much for presenting this. Thank you. This is not your, your first time at the Marines Memorial, and I know it won't be your last time. We, we welcome you, and James will stay and sign some books. Uh, thank you all for coming and supporting the Marines Memorial and the Meet the Author series. And we'll see you next time on the 6th of May. Thank you. Semper Fi. <laughs> well done.